Thousands of years, we have been conducting an uncontrolled experiment on the human mind. Remember to stop the bleeding. Stop. Sometimes we take drugs and alcohol to block out reality. Sometimes we take them to enjoy the social world. People in all walks of life are involved in this vast experiment, and anyone can fall victim to addiction. When I first attempted to stop taking sleeping tablets, I just stopped, and I felt so well for two or three days. And then on the fourth day, I suddenly thought I was climbing the walls. I just felt demented. I felt absolutely insane. I went out and I couldn't wait to get home and it's as though my whole being was screaming. My body was screaming and my brain was screaming. I, I can't describe it any more than that. It was the worst thing I've ever experienced. All of the drugs and the compulsive behaviors that I work with, that I have seen in the last 25 years, be it cocaine, heroin, alcohol, nicotine, gambling, sexual addiction, food addiction, do have one common thread, and the common thread is the covering up or the masking or on the unwillingness on the part of the human being to confront and be with their human feelings. In this program, we'll meet addicts, people who are struggling to regain control over their minds and bodies. Addiction means to repeat any behavior, such as taking drugs, which harms ourselves or others, and to crave that behavior. Downers like heroin, Valium, or alcohol. Uppers like cocaine or amphetamine. Because they physically change the brain, all these drugs can literally make us lose our minds. Scientists are now studying the frightening battle between chemicals and the self for control of brain and mind. They found that while we can succumb to our animal drives, we can also use our distinctly human minds to regain control. And their research reveals a shocking variety in the ways we can fall victim to addiction. Jim Sloan, his life shattered by drugs, today will help researchers in Philadelphia develop ways to rebuild his addict's mind. His strange ordeal in the sealed chamber will last nearly an hour. But how did he get in the fix he's in? Five years ago, he had only one drug problem. Uh, the only addiction that I had at the time was cigarettes. It had started at a very early age and uh, didn't consider that an addiction until, like, later in my life. And when I considered it an addiction, I quit. Wasn't easy, but, you know, I'd been smoking 18 years, but I did manage to break the habit. Then cocaine came into Jim's life. I, was, I had an eye injury in the hospital, and uh, there was a large cash award of I uh, ended up with a little over $100,000. And uh, I was single, living by myself, going out with several friends who used cocaine. And I couldn't see the point in it. So, uh, you know, it was offered several times. And finally, I decided I would try it. 
basically because I wanted to show how stupid it was to use $50 worth of cocaine for something that was going to last a few seconds. You, know, you can't make $50 in a few seconds. So I tried it, snorting it, and didn't get anything at all out of it. So then it was presented to me that uh, maybe if you tried free basin, you know, you'd, you'd get a different reaction. So about a week went by and got with the same group of people and I tried free basin for the first time. And it was a tremendous rush. It was like every pain, every ache in my body was gone. And it was like having an orgasm with every nerve ending in my body at the same time. It was like the sexual act magnified. And from that point on, I was a cocaine addict. Look at what I lost. You know, I lost a family. Right now, I'm totally by myself. I don't have any income. The physical damage alone, um, you're playing with death, you know? I've had sessions where I would fall out on the floor, my heart would be palpitating, you know, to a tremendous rate, and I would get very frightened that I was going to die. And I would, while I was laying there, swear to myself and to God that once it was past, I wouldn't do this again. And I'd get right up off the floor, and five or ten minutes later, I'd be getting high again. In every American city, there are thousands of cocaine and heroin addicts. Scientists like Conan Kornetsky believe that uppers and downers, which seem so different to users, in fact may be working on our minds in similar ways. Over here we have Roxbury. Roxbury is an area where there's probably very high heroin use. Behind me is the South End. South End is probably a mixed area. We have heroin use and cocaine use. Behind the South End is Back Bay. Back Bay is probably more a cocaine use area. Now here we have diverse groups of people using quite different drugs, yet probably the same areas of the brain are involved in the pleasures and the effects of these substances. Today, there is urgency in the scientific search for the brain circuits affected by drugs. The only thing we ask you to do is to try to hold your head as still as possible. In the last century, the search had hardly begun. In the latter part of the 19th century, we really weren't too concerned about addictions. The heroin that was available at the time was in many medicinals. And most of the users at that time were older people. Middle-aged women, in fact, were the main users of heroin. There were two other groups of uh, heroin users in the latter part of the 19th century. One is a group we call the opium eaters. And these mainly were sort of the yuppies of the time. These were the people interested in the arts. And although it was frowned upon, people didn't pay too much attention to this. However, at the same time, we had people in the West Coast who were smoking opium. And a lot of people were very upset about this because the people smoking opium weren't the upper class. They were Chinese workers. And uh, the first punitive laws in this country against the use of drugs was against the Chinese in San Francisco in the 19th century. Now, at the same time that all this was happening, uh, Freud had discovered cocaine. Freud made a serious mistake. He thought cocaine was a new wonder drug which could cure his patients of their addiction to heroin. Since then, whole societies have made the same kind of mistake. During the 30s and early 40s, amphetamine was uh, extensively used. During World War II, pilots, uh, air crew members, used amphetamine on long missions. It was only after the war that amphetamines became a serious problem. In the late 40s, I was a student, a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, and I obtained a position at the Addiction Research Center. Actually, it was the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, which was a prison hospital for the treatment of opiate use, or any drug that was against the law based on the Harrison Narcotic Act. Kornetsky and his colleagues carefully recorded the effects of different drugs. When opiates are abruptly withdrawn after chronic administration, an abstinence or withdrawal syndrome emerges, indicating the development of physical dependence. 
He yawns and is restless, complains of aches and pains, and exhibits fever, goose flesh, excessive sweating, and vomiting. The twitching in the legs has given rise to the expression, kicking the habit. Amphetamines, too, had bizarre effects. In this scene, the subject is chasing a non-existent butterfly through the air and catching it and handing it to the examiner. He then plucks insects from the skin of his arm. But the psychotherapy available at the time failed to help these addicted patients. Well, I became concerned by the fact that it didn't seem like we were doing very much for these people. I became aware that maybe we were not looking at the proper measure. We really should be looking at why are these drugs reinforcing, why are they rewarding, why do they produce pleasurable effects? Well, about that time in the early 50s, uh, Heath in Louisiana reported some interesting studies in man suggesting that there might be some sort of pleasure area in the brain. You almost look like you're smiling a bit, are you? Oh, no, I? Heath implanted electrodes in the brains of chronically depressed patients, hoping to stimulate pleasurable sensations. I guess I've cracked up all the way. I don't know. I mean, that's where you're smiling. Probably. Well, you look like you're really... <laughs> what are you laughing about? I don't know. Huh? What do you mean? Do you need something to me? Not surprisingly, the experiments were controversial. But the electrodes did have an effect especially near an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Heath even let his patients control their own stimulation. I find this button the best. That's the number most, two button. Most pleasurable. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you feel? I, I made a small joke yesterday. I don't know if I should repeat it or not. I'd like to hear it. You think it's worth repeating? What about the very deep, deep electrode all the way down? <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to tell me how it excites you, is that it? No, I think it's kind of a, I think it's somewhat of a sexy button. Oh. Is that why you said it went all the way down? Perhaps we get pleasure from drugs because they stimulate the same brain areas as sex and food. Working in Montreal in the 1950s, James Olds devised a crucial test. He worked out a new way to, in effect, ask animals how they felt. This is a device which trains the animal to turn on the stimulus for himself. Here you notice the animal wandering toward the pedal. When he first touches it, he gets no stimulation. It's not connected yet. Then one time he touches the pedal, it does turn on the stimulation. You can see the lights go on. Now, the interesting thing about the old stimulation, the rewarding stimulation, was the strength of it. It was somewhat different than rewarding stimulation for food and water in that there was no satiation. Animals would continue for hours and hours and didn't seem to satiate. They didn't feel full. They would just keep doing it for long, long periods of time. They would do it to exhaustion. Now, I will electrify the grid. The animal must cross an area that gives a very painful shock to the feet in order to get to the pedal and stimulate the brain. And a rat wanting brain stimulation would brave a shock stronger than even a starving rat would brave to get food. This shows a rat is willing to pay a very high price in order to get to the pedal. Human addicts will pay just as high a price for their rewards. Everything is about getting high. And any means necessary to get there becomes rational. If it means stealing something from somebody close to you, then you'll do that. Um, if it means lying to your family, uh, uh, borrowing money from people you know you can't pay back, writing checks you know you can't cover. You know, you do all of those things. And uh, if you're sitting around a table freebasing, five people freebasing, one of them falls out on the floor and dies, you don't call for help because that's more cocaine for the rest of them. In the laboratory, which drugs would cause an animal to pay that kind of price? The fascinating thing was 
that we found in our laboratory that every single drug that increased sensitivity of the animal to brain stimulation was either an abuse substance or a substance that has potential for abuse. So James Old's technique of the 50s gave scientists a way of testing for the addictive potential of drugs. And a way to find out where in the brain they acted. Now I think there's general agreement that this is the area where the action is in terms of the rewarding effects of drugs. Whether they be heroin, whether they be amphetamine, whether they be cocaine or angel dust or whatever the... Well, any drug that produces rewarding effects, it's believed this is where the action is. Using similar methods, Chris Fibiger and his colleagues in Vancouver wanted to know which pleasure areas are active when we crave both drugs and food. They found that the area Heath stimulated in his patients the nucleus accumbens is the center of a key network, the dopamine circuit. Heroin seems to act in one way. Cocaine in another. And both hit the nucleus accumbens, which the Canadian scientists recently proved is also active when we crave food. If we selectively take these dopamine neurons out of that part of the brain, the animal loses interest in self-administering cocaine, it seems. Uh, there's apparently the drug is no longer reinforcing. The same story seems to apply for amphetamine. If you destroy these dopamine-containing neurons in the nucleus accumbens, amphetamine self-administration uh, disappears as well. And I think that this approach is going to be able to tell us something about how the human mind works in the sense that what is it that causes feelings of pleasure, feelings of sadness, depression, euphoria, all of these things are processes that take place probably involving these reward circuits that we're looking at. The use of these drugs will often lead to compulsive use. Uh, and compulsive use is not certainly limited just to drugs. We have people who compulsively eat, people who are involved in compulsive sex, and this certainly is not normal behavior. The interesting thing about these drugs is that they can produce a compulsive use very easily. They're so rewarding, so reinforcing, that pretty soon all types of behavior are excluded. The person really reverts back to almost a very primitive type of animal. A heroin addict has volunteered to be given a large dose of morphine, chemically similar to heroin, by scientists at the National Institute for Drug Abuse in Baltimore. Today, using new methods, researchers can at last start to look at where drugs act in the human brain. The new machines reveal why different drugs make us act like primitive animals. Morphine shuts down the higher cortex and leaves the older emotional brain in charge. Cocaine gives a boost to the whole brain, but especially stimulates the primitive centers of emotion. So from those rough and ready experiments in the 1950s, scientists did learn where in the brain many addictive drugs act, but not how they act. What in the hell are you doing? <laughs> Huh? What do you mean? Then, in the 1960s, came the Vietnam War. Hold on, let me buy that ball from you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is, this is probably all Sid's and we're getting busted, but okay. I don't care. Chuck <laughs> Norris. <laughs> With Vietnam came a whole generation of young men starting to take drugs, mainly because they were so scared. I don't believe I would have became addicted to heroin if it wasn't for Vietnam. For something as gross as putting needles in my arm to get influence or high off a, off a drug. 
No. I really and truly can say if it wasn't for Vietnam, I would have never been on heroin or hard drugs. Can you get him back here? Okay, can you get him back here, though? Well, it, it was awesome. I mean, it was daily for me to see somebody limbs blown off, decapitated, cut all up. I, I just hate to think about it. I mean, I just had to be sedated on something. Oh, man. Uh, wait one, uh, we'll get this man out of here. And so Vietnam gave new impetus to the scientific research. Many, many people had been using heroin in Vietnam. What was heroin? How did heroin work? These were issues which had always been of interest to scientists, but they suddenly became also of interest to politicians who then started to give money for research in these areas. They gave it at exactly the right time. The Vietnam grants went to researchers who were beginning to find out just how drugs turn different nerve cells on or off. The drugs were working through receptors. All of what happened in terms of our understanding of these receptors, in terms of our understanding of the things which would interact with the receptors, took place really because of one man, a man named Hans Kosterlitz, who works right here in Aberdeen, Scotland, in this building right across the way. The man was over 70 when he said, it's now time to do my secret idea, to look for a morphine in the brain. One day, when I, I was working in the laboratory, and one of my young students came to see me, and then he asked me, now, why do you do that? Why are you interested in morphine and, and things? Why? Obviously, we all know something about it. I hesitated. I didn't want to say what I really thought, but this young man forced me, and I said, well, you know, if you keep it to yourself and don't tell anybody, then I have a suspicion there may be a morphine-like substance in the, in the brain. Now, that was in the early 60s. And in 1972, Hans Kosterlitz found his natural morphine. It was an incredibly simple experiment. It simply involved a strip of muscle, the effect of an extract of the brain changing the way that muscle contracted. But it really wasn't so simple because it was a totally prepared mind. It was a lifetime of effort. The substance produced naturally in the brain affected the strips of muscle just as heroin had. The brain's own morphine Heroin. The molecules had identical recognition sites. So that's why an extract from a puppy can affect the brain. The brain itself naturally uses something similar. From the studies which were done here in Aberdeen, where two morphine-like substances were discovered, we now know that the brain may have a couple of dozen morphine-like materials doing all sorts of things. They may be involved in pain, may be involved in temperature regulation, blood pressure. They may be important in addiction, but they may also be important in depression, in psychoses, in all sorts of bodily processes. They are critical to human beings, and they may be among the most important neurotransmitters that are present in our brain. While the actions of the old opiate drugs were leading to knowledge about the molecules of mind, many new psychoactive substances were being developed. And so, in the respectable suburbs of the Western world, the vast, uncontrolled experiment took a new turn. In the 1960s came the tranquilizers, like Valium. They were prescribed to millions. I was first prescribed tranquilizers because I was very depressed and under a lot of stress. My marriage was breaking down and I had just had our second child. 
nobody said anything about being depressed because I just had a baby. I just simply went to my doctor and said, I'm very, very depressed. And she assumed I couldn't cope and gave me tranquilizers. For 20 years, Lisa was given various versions of these drugs. At the peak, 15% of the population in Europe and America was taking them. At first, they were not thought to be addictive. I had three attempts at stopping to take my sleeping tablets. And I was so ill when I stopped that I would start taking them again. I didn't know how to stop. I suspected they were making me ill. But at the same time, I'd come to believe that I was a totally inadequate person who, without these sleeping tablets, would become such a burden. I was finding life so difficult to live, increasingly difficult, that I was afraid I would be institutionalized and I didn't want my family to see what I was believing was the real me, a person who just couldn't cope with life. I went to the drawer and I looked at them and I said, I haven't seen you for so long, let me look at you, let me take you out and let me feel you. And, and I thought, oh my God, I'm an addict. I'm, I'm an absolute addict. The tranquilizers Lisa was taking are called benzodiazepines. In London, pharmacologist John Littleton believes these drugs and alcohol may have a similar effect on brain cells. I was struck by the fact that a large proportion of the patients we were treating were alcoholics. And that there was really very little we could do for them. And there was very little understanding of the kind of changes that happened in brain uh, as a result of long-term administration of drugs, including alcohol, but also including things like benzodiazepines. Hello, Joyce. What have we got here today? Here's our keratin cells. It's looking quite good. Sure. OK. We were interested in the way in which alcohol affected nerve cells, particularly because uh, nerve cells, nerve cell excitability is inhibited by alcohol and this probably results in the intoxication that one gets with alcohol. Now other drugs probably also inhibit nerve cell excitability but nerve cells in different parts of the brain so that for example morphine will produce a loss of pain sensation and will produce euphoria but the actual effect on the nerve cell is probably a reduction in the excitability of the nerve cell. And what we found is that in the continued presence of alcohol, we think the nerve cells adapt so that their excitability uh, regains its normal level. It is calcium channels which allow electrical charges to enter a cell. Chronic use of some drugs or alcohol suppresses these channels, so the cell compensates by making more channels. When the drug or alcohol is stopped, both old and new channels can operate. So the nerve cell overreacts, producing the painful symptoms of withdrawal. I would experience electric shocks going all over my body, and my skin felt as though I'd been scalded with hot water. I felt as though my body was, was actually falling apart, that my, leg, my arms and legs would come off, and that my chest would, would just fall open. I felt as though my brain was clogged up with the debris and the dead stuff from tranquilizers and sleeping tablets. So when I stopped taking them, it was as though my thought processes were rivers, and there were thousands and thousands of these. And some were still blocked, and the water couldn't get through, and some were flooding, and some were, were crossing over, and. There was so much thought, there were so many thought processes forming a sort of river and it was, it was crazy. I couldn't cope with it. It was, it was insanity. We think that this change in the number of calcium channels may be a common mechanism which underlies the development of physical dependence on drugs which depress the nervous system. And by drugs which depress the nervous system, I mean alcohol, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and morphine. So since Vietnam, researchers have made crucial progress in understanding the effects of drugs on nerve cells.
but the war experience was to deliver another extraordinary surprise. The men addicted in Vietnam started to come home. The Veterans Administration was extremely concerned because the men were being sent back from Vietnam and they thought that their services would be absolutely flooded with people requiring drug services, which they didn't have. There was also a lot of public fear in terms of what it would mean to the public to have all of these addicts coming back to the United States, presumably robbing people and killing people in order to get money for drugs. The problem in Vietnam was that drugs were extremely cheap, particularly heroin, and so that ordinary enlisted men had been able to use it quite freely and to afford it. Anything you got over there was awful good. You know, I mean, it did what it was supposed to do, and it did it right away. And and there was there was all types. There was a liquid and a tar-based type of it. They had uh, you did everything with it, from drink it to eat it to shoot it to whatever you wanted to do with it. Vietnam veterans get together at Danny Miller's bar in South St. Louis. Nearly everybody here used drugs in Vietnam. Everybody. And I mean, I was in a company of 158 men. One guy in that company didn't use drugs. Just one. That was the only thing you could do that made you relax. It made you not just walk around like this all the time. But the findings of Lee Robbins' large-scale study came as a shock to addiction researchers. To our great delight and to the government's great surprise, we found that most of these men had very little trouble with drugs after they got back. I didn't have any trouble with drugs when I got home. None whatsoever. I got home and I was, I was in fine shape. People were very curious about how this could happen. It so violated all their expectations. And one of the commonest beliefs was, uh, after the fact, that the reason was that these men had become addicted in one environment and then had moved to another environment and that they couldn't get drugs easily in the States, and that had explained the, the change. Well, we explored that in a number of ways. In the first place, we asked them if they knew where to get heroin if they wanted it in the States, and 85% of them said yes. We also found that a great many of them had indeed tried heroin again after they came back. About half of all the addicts actually went back to heroin, tried it, and still didn't get addicted. But a few did remain addicted after Vietnam. What makes some people more vulnerable than others? One of the possibilities is that these men are genetically different, that some people have a much greater liability much more likely to become addicted if they get exposed to sufficient heroin. We don't have much information about genetic factors because this is a new epidemic. None of the parents of these people have ever been exposed to illicit drugs, and certainly not to heroin. We have found that antisocial behavior in parents and alcohol dependence in parents uh, are related to the use of drugs in young people and perhaps to the uh, continuation into addiction. Because alcohol has been with us for many generations, alcoholism is the only addiction which is known to be at least partly inherited. My grandfather was a heavy drinker, and I was told that my father was a heavy drinker, but I don't know. Um, my mother and father separated when I was about four and a half years old. The first time I drank, I drank a, a fifth of whiskey, and uh, I really liked it, you know, the high, the, the giggles and, and just enjoyed it. Uh, on the way home, I got sick, and uh, I didn't care too much for that, you know. And I thought this, this is crazy. But then again, the very next night, I done the same thing, you know. Uh, I can look back on this experience now, you know, and I knew that I drank alcoholically from the start. Al has a type of alcoholism that seems to be passed from father to son. The drinking starts young and goes with antisocial behavior. I came home one day and opened a can of beer and sat down on the couch, and my son was about uh, four and a half years old at the time, and he walked up to me and he says, Gosh, Daddy, you sure drink an awful lot of beer. You know, and, it, and it, uh, it made me a little angry, you know, but after I thought about it for a while, you know, 
he just made me aware that I did have a problem with alcohol that I'd been denying. Is there any way to find out if the child of an alcoholic has inherited a parent's susceptibility? Recently, Al came to Brooklyn to take a new kind of test. Ari Begleiter studies brain deficits in alcoholics. There are a number of deficits. In fact, one of the most remarkable findings of our long-term investigations is the fact that we found deficits almost every place we looked. We found sensory deficits. We found the deficits in very primitive areas of the brain, such as the brain stem, for instance. And uh, more recently, in the last 10 years, we have uncovered a number of deficits in abstinent alcoholics in cognition. The technique for attaching electrodes to his scalp is quite painless. Al hasn't had a drink for six years, but will the test still reveal abnormalities in his brain? I'm uh, Dr. Begleiter. How are you, sir? How are you today? Hi. All right. We're going to see if we can test you, if you'll accompany us to the chamber here. I need to press this button whenever you hear the low tone. Uh, the one on the left. Yes. Okay? Okay. I'm put the headphones on you. Al's behavior seems normal, but Begleiter's test will show if Al's brain yeah fails to respond normally to new stimuli, changed sounds or changed angles. In normal people, unexpected sounds or images evoke special brain waves called P3, often missing in alcoholics. Will Al's brain show the telltale deficit? Computer analysis isolates the P3 waves in brain cross-sections. On this side, we have enlarged the display of the normal control. And what you see here is a rather large area, which indicates that P3 is very strong in voltage in this normal control. This is manifested by this large red spot, which is located toward the back of the head. On the other hand, if you look at the topogram, which we obtained from Al, you can see that the P3 is totally absent in this area of the brain. Indeed, you can see the difference is rather striking between the P3 distribution here and the absence of any P3 voltage on this side. And the crucial question, is this the effect of years of alcohol or the sign of a true genetic trait? Begleiter's team has been testing young boys who probably have never had a drink. This boy's brain shows no P3 deficit, but he doesn't have alcoholic parents. Now a boy who does have an alcoholic father. The P3 is missing, just as in Al's brain. Our hope is that this deficit can be construed as a valid and reliable biological marker for subsequent alcohol abuse. So some children can now be warned of the special risk they may run if they start drinking, the risk of addiction. I started getting real depressed. Uh, I think basically I wanted to drink, but I didn't want to drink. And then with nothing changing, my wife decided she was going to leave anyway. And that's when the depression really set in. I knew that if I kept on in that depression, that eventually I was going to die. I would eventually kill myself. You know, I knew I had to go somewhere. I knew I had to get out of that depression. Alcoholics Anonymous helped Al to kick the habit, and he still needs the support of the group to keep sober. For any addict, temptation is always there. Well, it's just like, I guess, you know, alcoholic has to walk down the street and, and pass a bar without getting a craving for a drink. Uh, drugs are everywhere, especially, in, you know, where I live and areas that I have to travel through. You have people standing on the corner selling drugs openly. 
calling you from your, from, you know, if you drive by, they, they stop your car and offer you different things. You're approached sometimes with free drugs, you know, they try to steer you into a, a situation where uh, something's going to trigger you and get you started again. There's a lot of triggers, a tremendous amount of triggers. One of them is, is a, a sum of money. If you get your hands on 20 or $50 at one time, that's a hit. There are other things, like um, if you see some of the paraphernalia involved, um, the smell of matches that, that you use when you're freebasing. Somebody lights a cigarette around you, you might start thinking about getting high. Today, Jim is going to the Veterans Administration Hospital in Philadelphia, where Anna Rose Childress wants to know if he can still resist his triggers. How have the stress has been this past week in terms of triggers for craving? How has that been for you? Well, uh, I had one incident where I had to go into an apartment because of flooding from my landlord, and a guy is a, a crack addict, and all the equipment was laying around, mm -hmm. and... Uh, Right the there in your crack face. Files, but, but it didn't affect me in the same way. For eight months now, Jim has been taking General part in a very unusual experiment. Um, had there been some actual cocaine there, it might have been a different story. Might have been. Know? That's a pretty powerful cue. Wow. What's that? He's being exposed to the most intense triggers, while his breathing, heart rate, and skin temperature are measured. Okay, Jim, are you feeling any high, one to 10? One. Are you feeling any withdrawal or crash symptoms, one to 10? One. Jim's body and mind are being made to unlearn some of his own particular triggers. Okay, Jim, we're ready for today's drug preparation. If you'd be good enough to open the box and continue, please, up to the point of inhalation. Finally, he actually has to prepare to freebase cocaine. You'll get into uh, actual ritual of getting high without getting high. So you'll cook up cocaine, you'll put it in a pipe as if you're going to smoke it, and then they'll take it from you. You'll go through this ritual like three times in a row, and then you'll watch a tape, and then you'll do it again. And uh, after doing that, over a period of time, you get desensitized to the point where you can handle these things without the craving because you know you're not going to complete the act. This was how his body reacted five months ago. An especially large drop in temperature. And today... He's still breathing a little more deeply, but mm -hmm. the respiration is regular. And the temperature is holding steady, mm -hmm. 97. No drop at all. He did his first cook up, his temperature dropped into the upper 70s. So he's still above 95. Significant improvement. It's taken 20 sessions to suppress Jim's physiological responses. So maybe he can now resist his triggers. I feel extremely hopeful that this kind of work is sort of a step. It's, it's not the end point, because we have a lot more to learn about chemical interventions. There may be things that are important, but at this stage of the knowledge, being able to do an intervention like this and buy a patient some drug-free time is crucial because prevention of relapse is really where it's at at this point. We can spend lots of money on prevention, but we don't know how many people that we're actually going to reach of those that are targeted, and we don't know how effective that's going to be, and it's a very expensive sort of thing to do. We can spend a lot of money detoxifying, and we do, but we know that patients often go directly out of detoxification and use the same day or the same week, so we know that's not enough. So we have to think about that phenomenon of relapse and try to buy some abstinent time. And this is one way of doing that. Now, Jim is getting back with his family. It would be wonderful to have magic. 
Um, at this point, we settle for little bits of magic. And when someone has 14 months of abstinence after 17 years of continuous drug use, for me, that's a good piece of magic. With no help from doctors or scientists, some addicted people have invented their own ways to reverse the effects of addiction on body and mind. I realize now I was so addicted to my capsule that I wanted to stay with that until the bitter end. I didn't want to swap over to a green pill or a white pill. I wanted my capsule. Lisa Harrison devised a very special way to cut down her dose. It just fell into place somehow. It was special having a piece of gold card and having a rather ornate glass ashtray. It, it, it reinforced the ritual of the whole thing. As I was coming off, I began to realize more and more that I was enjoying the ritual of cutting down and the pre precision it involved, the, the steady hand and getting the exact amount. And when one is addicted, one has to get the last little bit off into the back into the capsule all this came into the sort of undoing process um a retrograde addiction process somehow and all this ritual certainly seems to have helped things are 100% better than they were six months ago and I've been off now for one year so things have progressively opened up for me my mind is opening up my visions opening up my ears are opening up my intelligence is opening up I just can't begin to explain it to anybody I still crave um, I find that really bewildering when it happens because it's totally irrational can look at a tablet and think this is going to make me ill it won't even put me back where I was you know, I can't take one and be in the, even in the state of mind I was in a year ago and yet I crave it yet I imagine what it would be like to take a Valium but have to talk myself right out of it instantly but this is this really frightens me this addiction is stronger than I am in a sense this is really out in the boonies Feeling a little nervous? Real nervous. Few can escape addiction on their own. Mark, a cocaine addict, is going with his mother to an unusual center in the hills north of Sacramento, California. There is alcoholism in Mark's family, and he himself started drinking at the age of 12. He started snorting cocaine at 17, and that put an end to his college career. I think I'm unfortunate to He was spending more than $500 a week on cocaine and became a drug dealer to feed his habit. The director of the Coke Enders program is Richard Miller. Addiction uh, to drugs is one of the very few uh, illnesses that human beings encounter where they can actually be suffering and denying that they have the problem at the exact same time. You see, when we bleed, if I have uh, a blood here and I look down, all of a sudden I see this blood all over my clothing, I'm going to go for help because I can see the blood. But when we're bleeding from the soul, when we're bleeding from the spirit, we can't see the blood and we can easily deny. And so what happens is when we're taking the drugs, we don't want any help because we're either high on the drug or we're so miserable that we don't want, you know, just coming off it that we just can't conceive of help. When we're not using the drug, we can lie to ourselves and we say, oh, well, I'm off the drug now. I don't need help again. And so people can go on for years like that. But when the blood is red and it's all over the clothing, we go right out for it. And so we can deny and deny. And that's why many of the people that I work with have been using uh, drugs for 10 and 20 and 30 years. At first, Mark denied that his cocaine and drinking habits were linked. And finally, uh, finally, I opened up to that. Um, and I admitted that. And the realization for me was, Mark, if you don't cope, you don't drink. If you don't drink, you don't coke. That was real simple. But 
it wasn't I didn't see it so simple. I recognized it and, and you know I was in big time denial of my alcohol. Um, I just didn't want to go to AA. I just didn't want to go. The cocaine I could handle because it's against the law. It's a felony. And a lot of good people have been busted for it and they go through rehabs and then they are accepted back in society. This is the way I, I perceived it. I mean, I was a drug dealer. And we all have our idea of a drug dealer. And I don't look like a drug dealer to me. Um, you know, my family. I mean, it goes beyond just yourself. Of what I've come to realize. And I didn't see any of this. Um. The last three years have been very, very intense for him. And I did all the mother kinds of things and talked to him and, and uh, uh, belittled him and uh, coerced him. I did everything I thought possible to make him realize that that taking drugs and drinking were not for him. They were the wrong things to do. And uh, it just kept getting worse and worse, and, and uh, things just snowballed, and, and his story got worse, and a lot of you probably have heard some of it. Um, but the change has been wonderful. He's growing. I mean, he's, he's in the last three months is all it's been. And he's had, a, he's had one setback. The addicted family is really nothing more or less than a symptom of the entire society in the same way that when I have an infection in my hand that keeps coming back and coming back, I can keep treating the hand, but if I don't eventually look at my entire system and say, what is there about my own system that's creating the infection here? If I don't do that eventually, the infection will reoccur over and over. And so what she is telling us is that how much she was affected by the fact that her son uh, went into drugs, became a drug addict, but also if we look carefully, we see that she was very involved in creating that drug addict. And, and let, me, let me tell you, too, I, I thought this was all a bunch of shit when I was here, you know? I sat here in these chairs saying, I don't need to stop going to bars and parties. Um, the bar thing is a, big, is a big chain for me, and I have not been able to break that chain. Although I am not drinking, I'm still going into those, those places. And that's a very slippery place for me. You're walking on fire. I know that. Tom and I talked about that today. Um, but I can tell you that... Um, Don't tell us anymore. Use any energy that you're going to use to tell us anymore to think about your hanging out in those bars. Save that energy for yourself. You need it. But I know you want to give us some more. Save every drop of it. Put it into those bars. Because those bars could put you behind bars. They have. When they experience in the group the intimacy of true sharing, of letting their guards down, and of still being accepted, that sense of being accepted by others when revealing the things that we are sure that we're going to be rejected for gives them a spiritual connection that is unmatched by any drug that they can take. Well, I can't even tell you what it does for my heart to have him back and, and to know that he's going he's gonna to be around for a while. Say that to him, please. I just love you so much, and I'm so happy for you. Oh, well. <laughs> the road ahead will be hard for Mark. But he's taken the first step. Science can't yet tell us why Mark is addicted, while others with the same drug experience can walk free. But we do know that the addicted brain is a changed brain. The molecules and networks of our brains have been designed to make us creatures of habit. And drugs have a hotline to those networks. We also know that the addicted mind is a changed mind. By an effort of will and with the help of others, we can sometimes reverse our addictions. But the vast, uncontrolled experiment on the streets of the world is gathering speed. And when we experiment with our exquisitely balanced brains and minds, we do so at our peril. I'm George Page.
This program was sponsored by KBDI members, our single largest source of support.